Welcome to another episode of our personal empowerment audio program, Finding Yourself in Paradise. Hi, I'm Michael Benner. And I'm Steve Snyder, and our program today is entitled Beliefs and Attitudes. We're going to talk about that choice you have in between the stimulus and the response, the first choice you have about how you're going to view or experience or what mood you're going to be into, the attitude or the beliefs you have about what you experience in your life. Yeah, you know, attitude is everything. Like you say, it's about choice. I like to think of attitude, first of all, as very different from knowledge or understanding. Uh, It's related to beliefs, and we'll talk about your belief system, how attitude and beliefs are related. But one way to think about it, I think, is a, a middle position, really, between what happens to us and what we do with it. It's as if Attitude colors our perception as well as our response. And that point of choice, that that middle point, is something that doesn't occur to a lot of people. I think, generally speaking, we're so stressed, especially in America, the United States, especially if you live in a big city and drive on urban freeways, we just focus on the part that's done to us. We don't think so much about our reactions, but... To find that middle point, to make choices, to consciously choose the attitudes and the beliefs that you're going to live from is to really affect those reactions so that they're more like a conscious response. So we have stimulus, attitude, and response. Yeah, John Wooden said uh, things work out best for the people who make the best out of the way things work out, you know, and and so stuff happens, good stuff happens, bad stuff happens to everybody, but attitude is what we color it with. Attitude is what we make it, you know, like, uh, oh, that was tough, but it's a good lesson I'll learn, or boy, life is against me, I'm a victim of everything. We we have those choices in in the attitudes that we take, and, and, you know, almost all the greatest philosophers, almost all the greatest uh Mind scientists always talked about the power of positive thinking, the power of positive attitude, the power of of the mind's ability to see things in a positive way and change the very nature of things. Because although, as we've said many times, there is a reality, I mean, there is an objective reality out there, but, you know, all we experience is our perception of it. And and so when our perception changes, our reality changes. And and by seeing things through rose-colored glasses versus, you know, dark, somber glasses, We change our perception of the world. So the key is that we do have the choice. The problem is that we don't make the choice. Usually our attitude is the exact attitude we had last time the experience came up. We don't choose to change our attitude. We just go with the attitude we have, often because we're stuck with a particular belief. And the belief is usually not a choice. At some point early on it might have become been a choice, but usually not. It's usually just something we haven't even thought about, we just accept and we just believe, and the beliefs that we have, the deep, deep core beliefs we have, those color our attitudes. Saturday Night Live used to have a character called Debbie Downer, and I think we all know at least one person in our lives, a guy or a gal, who is always the wet blanket. And what's seductive, I think, about being a helpless victim and being always negative and pessimistic in your attitude is that you get sympathy. But to confuse sympathy with what we really want, which is love, is a serious mistake. Sympathy is not love. There are times that sympathy is appropriate. Uh, You know, the dog dies or somebody that you care about passes and people express their sympathies to you. Well, that's fine, but the idea is you heal from that, you recover from that. So if sympathy is something that you want to recover from, then that's really not a lifestyle. It's not an intelligent lifestyle choice to settle for sympathy when what you really want is love. You know, I used to challenge my students when I taught in Los Angeles to uh, go out and Pay attention in public places like in restaurants or wherever they happen to be and just uh, listen in, eavesdrop a little bit on uh, public conversations that people have and make note of what percentage of them are positive and optimistic and 
folks talking about what they did uh, to, to improve somebody's life, to make the world a better place, versus those conversations where people are petitioning each other for sympathy and, and <laughs> really trying to outdo each other about, well, you think you're miserable, I'm way more miserable than you, let me tell you my sob story. And it becomes often a battle for, you know, eminence. Who's got the the, the worst sorrows and uh, the most negativity in their lives? And it's so common. My students had come back and they say, I, 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 I didn't hear one single positive conversation. Everybody is complaining. The problem is your subconscious mind is listening to these funky attitudes. And even if you don't speak out loud, if you just carry these negative, pessimistic attitudes within you, if you find somehow some a perverse benefit in negativity as if it'll protect you or make you safe. If you're always looking for how things can go to pieces and come apart, go south on you, or always waiting for the other shoe to drop, well, you're going to bring that about. The subconscious will, like fertile ground, grow whatever seed you plant into it, positive or negative. And, you know, society sort of, like, backs this up because... It's perfectly appropriate to, to, to one-up somebody with how life is terrible for you, more terrible for you than it is for them, you know, that, that sob story thing. But it's not okay to say how your life is better than somebody else's. It's not okay to say when somebody says, how are you doing? Well, gosh, I'm doing this. I have the best marriage in the world, and I live in the most beautiful place, and I have the greatest career. People don't want to hear that, you know, like makes them feel you're uncomfortable expressing how wonderful your life is to these people whose lives aren't as good as yours are. So it's like it's it's okay to say how bad things are, but somehow it's not okay to say how great things are and and it's so so weird. It's just like society loves bad news, you know, we don't buy good news. We don't want to hear about other people being happy. We don't want to read about other we want to we want to hear about other people more miserable than us, you know. It's it's just colored in our whole society. So you have to almost be a rebel. You have to like break through and you have to be one of those people who when people say how you doing you, you have to be willing to make them a little uncomfortable and say, I'm, I'm doing great. I'm doing better and better. I'm doing fantastic. Even though that's not really what they wanted to hear. What they wanted to hear was that your life is just as miserable as theirs is. <laughs> you know, there are um, said to be many incarnations of the Buddha. There's something like uh, uh, 14 different uh, personas of Buddha. One is often portrayed as the laughing Buddha. And yes. it's been debated over the years, what's he laughing at? What's so damn funny? And I think I think what the enlightened person finds hilarious is that life really is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Again, the subconscious mind is always listening to you. It does not have a will of its own. You have one will. It's in the conscious mind. The subconscious, as I said before, is more like a piece of fertile ground and whatever seed you throw, if it's a beautiful vegetable or fruit seeds, it'll grow that. If it's briars and brambles, it'll grow that. And so whatever our attitudes, whatever our belief systems, they tend to generate a, an awareness or a, or a consciousness that becomes self-fulfilling. Therefore, these negative people, these pessimists, begin to gather and accumulate evidence that they're absolutely right. We always notice we're in an extra long line, but we don't notice that we're in the normal speed line, you know? So it seems like it's, it's, here's more evidence that life sucks. I always get in the worst line. But the truth is, you didn't notice it when you didn't get in the worst line. We have a way of, the mind has a way of manifesting whatever it's looking for. Yeah, Buddha said that uh, karma is intention. Lots of times we think karma results from our actions, and certainly it does. Others say, no, it's our thoughts. Some will say, well, even your emotions will generate karma. But it's the awareness behind all of that. It's your intention. It's your will that generates 
these circumstances. So, you know, if you try, if you're positive and you try and you make an effort, then that's going to generate a positive outcome. If you fail or fall short, well, there's an opportunity for you to learn, uh, reset your intention, and go for it again with the highest of expectations. But, Steve, I know you have a uh, strong feeling about our fear of disappointment. I think that's one of the things that tends to hold people back. They're afraid they'll, if, if they try and fail, they'll just be devastated. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, I blame that primarily on parents who just didn't quite get the concept. You know, they, they thought it would be a good idea to protect their children from disappointment in childhood. Like, uh, you know, don't get your hopes up too high. We wouldn't want you to be disappointed. We wouldn't want you to feel the pain of disappointment. So, so they protect them, isolate them, insulate them. Not, not really thinking, you know, clearly, because it seems to me if you think it through, it becomes obvious that if you protect a child from disappointment in childhood, then when they inevitably experience it as an adult, it will devastate them. They'll have absolutely no tolerance for it, no experience with it, no way of dealing with it whatsoever. So I think it's really important that, that we teach our children to allow for disappointment. And it's, it's a good thing. It's a growth experience because otherwise we, we are afraid to get our hopes up high. We're afraid to set big goals. We're afraid to set big dreams. And, and the problem is the heart's not moved by small dreams. We need big dreams. We need giant dreams to, because, you know, as we've often said, why would you aim at anything other than the bullseye? The greatest possible outcome is what motivates us the most. So. What we want to do is, you know, we want to break through these fears we have, and we want to create our own belief systems and not be stuck in the belief systems that we grew up with, that we, we were born, not born with, but, but reared with, if you will. Most Many of the beliefs that people hold are the ones that just they developed early in childhood and they never let go of, they never examined at all. And, and we've been talking about the Buddha. Buddha had an incredible, uh, wonderful quote about this. He said, this is the, the Gautama Siddhartha Buddha. Um, do not believe in anything simply because you've heard it. Do not believe in anything simply because it's spoken and rumored by men. Do not believe in anything simply because it's found written in your religious books. Do not believe in anything merely on the authority of your teachers and elders. Do not believe in traditions because they've been handed down for many generations. But after observation and analysis, when you find that anything agrees with reason and is conducive to the good and benefit of one and all, then accept it and live up to it. Now, that's a great quote. The idea of examining all of those beliefs we have about the way the world operates that, that we just had from childhood and, and throw them all out the window and re-examine each one for its merit today, that would change your life in a wonderful way. Yeah, uh, I remember Timothy Leary in the 60s would say, uh, became a bumper sticker at the time, uh, think for yourself and question authority. And uh, somehow, authority. that's big, that's big. Yeah, somehow that was controversial at the time. Uh, only a counterculture person thought that. But my goodness, we should all be questioning authority. We should all be questioning that which is known. Um, because something has been believed for a long time doesn't make it true. It, it, it certainly merits study and observation. But gosh, we're learning so much and technology and and, and all aspects of science and even philosophy are growing and expanding. and We should always be questioning. It's only in the last few hundred years that, that the masses have questioned authority. So it's not, it's not a standard thing for human beings. For almost all of human history, the authority of the, the church or the, the uh, politics or whoever it was that was the leader, you don't question it. You die if you question their authority. It's not, it's not something you do. You just go along with the way it's supposed to be. And it's only the last few hundred years that, that human beings have begun to question authority and to look uh, to themselves for their answers. I don't know why it doesn't occur to more of us that we can use a simple phrase, when we appear to have failed, not yet. Just say, not yet. You know, when the law of attraction began to... Uh, be understood by a lot of folks. I guess it was a DVD and the book that came out in the, uh, I don't know, 2000, 2001 or so called The Secret. Suddenly this, uh, understanding of the law of attraction, um, became real popular and people said, oh, I tried that, right? And it didn't yeah, work. It yeah. And I thought about prosperity and I thought about all these material things and, and it didn't happen. Well, 
What's wrong with not yet? What's wrong with perseverance? What's wrong with being patient? I mean, I can grow radishes in three weeks, but asparagus takes three years, and we need to be patient. We need to persevere and see what other people might call failure as an opportunity to learn. Frankly, I, I really like, Steve, the way you say goals are not for attaining so much as determining a direction. Why don't you talk about that a bit? And, yeah, that's really, really important because, like, if if you do follow the philosophy of dreaming big and setting giant goals and aiming for the bullseye and going for the gold and, you know, expecting the very, very best possible outcome – of course, you're not going to get it most of the time. I mean, only one person wins the gold, you know. But not not only is there no shame in the silver and the bronze, there's, there's great joy in having competed at all and been on the level of being the best in the world. The whole idea here is that there's there's a need to dream big, but to have a high intention for that dream to, to occur, but a very low attachment. And that, then we get back to Buddhism again, because Buddhism talks about all pain is because of attachment. It's, it's needing that outcome. What occurred to me a really long time ago is I have a wonderful imagination, but nature, God, the universe, whatever you want to call it, is way better than me at this, at, at creativity and making stuff up. So if I say, that's what I want, but I need to have that, that incredible outcome I'm looking for, that's what I have to have, then I'm not only st- stuck with that as the only possible outcome that makes me happy, all, I'm not allowing for the universe to provide something that might even be a whole lot better than that, something I, that I wasn't even capable of dreaming of, something that I didn't have the information or the experience to be able to dream of. The universe could create something way better than for me than something I could make up. So, so I have to have a very... I hold very lightly. To me, the dream is like a soap bubble. You know, I hold it in my hand. It stays in my hand, but it's very fragile. It, it, it could pop at any time. It's fine because another one will form. I, I've changed my mind lots and lots of times in my life, but the most important thing is it's the journey, not the destination. So if you're aiming for something that's really, really wonderful, that really excites you, that really makes you enthusiastic and really makes you want to wake up and get out of bed every morning and go for it, then that's what life's about. And and whether or not you actually get there or not doesn't matter. What matters is that you get as close as you're capable of getting. And and the journey, the, the, the road is a wonderful road that you experience on the way. Yeah, we've been talking a lot about Eastern philosophy so far in this program, but let's remember for Christian friends that Christ said exactly the same thing. This uh, law of karma is also known in the West as the law of cause and effect. This is the allegory of the garden. I used it before. And Christ said, you reap what you sow. And uh, you can tell the mountain to go from here to there. And if you have as much faith as a mustard seed has in its ability to fulfill its destiny, the mountain will disappear. A beautiful metaphor for the the, the idea that most of the mountains in our lives, most of what seems to block our path or, or hinder us, is of our own making. We talk about um, sometimes feeling as if there's a barrier between us and our goals and our dreams that we have to smash through, that we have to overcome or somehow conquer uh, the these barriers of life that prevent us from having what we really want. We the, the, the truth is all we have to do is let it go. It's our mountain. It's our wall. We built it out of out of our negative beliefs, one one brick at a time. So we don't have to conquer anything. Just breathe, relax, and, and and watch life unfold before you. I mean, it's 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 a great challenge that is found in all religions and all philosophies to risk that. Steve, as you said, why what what arrogance to second guess uh, the universe, the absolute, the divine God, to, to believe that you know better how to solve your problems. And, and I, I, I mean, we all know the, the, the fear of believing that if we don't solve the problem, it's going to stay there or maybe even get worse. And we do have to take action. I'm not talking about just sitting in a closet and meditating and doing nothing, but 
what if that action comes from a proper orientation, from a positive attitude and a positive belief system? Then you're going to do much better. You're going to see these mountains as something that you either created or at least contributed to. And by understanding it, by asking important questions, you can let go of those barriers and move forward much more elegantly instead of dragging yourself through life, scraping along, you know, clawing. It often feels that way. It's, it's, it becomes more elegant, more like uh, embrace the problem and waltz it across the dance floor. That's, a, that's the feeling I like to bring to my problems. Nicely said. I think my favorite quote on this subject, in the most elegant, eloquent way it's ever been said, Maya Angelou said, if you don't like something, change it. If you can't change it, change your attitude. You know, that just says it all. I mean, there are things that you can change, and if you can, then change them. If you don't bitch about it. Don't moan. Just change it. If you can't change it, you can change your attitude. And if your attitude has been, this is an obstacle that I can't get past, you can change your attitude to, this is a life lesson I can learn and move around. You know, I mean, you can change your attitude. No one else can change your attitude without your permission, but you can change your attitude. And and you can always change your attitude. You can at any moment in time change your attitude, but the challenge in doing that is you have to wake up. You have to become aware of the fact that you're copping an attitude. <laughs> you have to become aware of the fact that this attitude that you've been using for this to deal with this thing and working for you. You know, it makes you unhappy. It makes you unsuccessful. It makes it, it isn't working for you. You change your attitude. How do you change your attitude? You close your eyes, you take a deep breath, you disconnect from the attitude that you had before, you observe it, therefore you're not in it, you're just observing it, you're up there watching it, looking down upon it and seeing it, and then saying, that attitude doesn't work. There's this other attitude I have had a bunch of times in my life, for example, the time that I did this and the time I did that. I'm going to use that attitude instead. I know exactly what that attitude feels like. I'm going to grab that attitude out of my memory bank, or I'm going to, I'm going to even make up a new attitude I've never had before. I'm going to about this attitude I heard about. Somebody told me they had this kind of thing. You, you can do anything you want, but you can't do anything unless you want. You can do anything you want, but unless you decide you want to do something, you're going to just keep doing the thing you've always been doing. I'd also like to suggest that beyond the idea of reorienting yourself, you know, in um, in airplane flight, in space flight, there's something called attitude also that has to do with your orientation relative to the ground. It's an interesting use of the term. So besides the attitudes we have about this particular problem, this event, this circumstance in our lives, consider that as a, a kind of a basic uh, syllogism, uh, a basic premise from which you live your life, there can be a primary attitude that we adopt, a general, overall, all-encompassing belief system. For example, how does this one sound? Things will work out. Or Everything things will be okay. Yeah, yeah, egg buck. Yeah. <laughs> things will work out for the better is the implication there. Things always work out. Again, in the, uh, the Christian Bible, and I believe it's also in the Hebrew Bible, the, the Old Testament, the idea that all things work together for good. Now, that's a challenging concept to most people. They might hear that in church or temple and then, uh, you know, consider it for two seconds and then go about their lives not really incorporating that or believing it, but accept the challenge. Do all things work together for good? Or better said, what would happen in your life if you really, really believed that all things work together for good? And then let me add the little phrase, in spite of their initial appearance. Yeah, because, yeah, <laughs> because it doesn't always look that way, right? It doesn't always look that way. And there, the pessimist has the evidence to say, see, it doesn't work. See, you were wrong. See, I, I was right. Pessimists live for that. See, I was right. Point. And, and there is a point when they are. I mean, you know, you can always create failure. You know, it's always possible to throw a monkey wrench in the works and find a point where, see, it's not working. 
But that that idea of an overall pervading attitude, a belief system that everything's going to work out for the best, that that yes, we're going to go through some hard times, but we're going to emerge on the other side, that there is light at the end of the tunnel. There's a million ways of saying that. But to me, that's that's the attitude, you know, and and that's what it takes. That's what it takes to create success, happiness, to rise to the top. I think uh, was it Zig Ziglar that said, "It's your attitude, not your aptitude, that creates your altitude." You know, it's like it's it's you know, you can have all kinds of talents and abilities, but if you don't have the right attitude, you're not going to do it. With the right attitude, you're highly likely to succeed. With the wrong attitude, you're inevitably going to fail. It's just attitude is is what. It takes, and and yes, there are individual circumstances where we need to change and adjust our attitudes for those circumstances. But as you were saying, Michael, there's an idea of like a a fallback, a a, a default, if you will, a, an autopilot. Like my my general attitude is, and that's where we can take pessimism and and have it rise into up into cautious optimism, you know up into a place where at least we're thinking, yes, things could go wrong, but you know what? They also could go right. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm going to leave room for the possibility that things really, they could go right, you know? That's funny. What have you ever heard anybody say that, you know? Things could go <laughs> you know, right, you know? <laughs> they could. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, 1974, gosh, nearly 40 years ago, it's hard to believe, that I took a class. At that time, I was living in Detroit, Motor City called Silva Mind Control. I bet a lot of our uh, listeners have heard of it. Jose and uh, Jose Silva was a remarkable man. He was uh, 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 not all that well educated. He had a third degree education. He was from a small town in Texas. And frankly, he had to work on the farm to help support his family. But in the military, he met a medical doctor who was also a hypnotist and hypnotherapist and was fascinated by suggestion and in particular what happens when we think positively and suggest to ourselves or to others in relaxed states the positive outcomes that we desire. And so he read this book that was loaned to him by the medical doctor. This would have been, you know, back in World War II. And later, in the um, early 60s, as he was raising his kids, and they were having a, a problem in school, he figured, well, stress and tension degrades your performance in school, so maybe relaxation would improve their performance. It was that simple. And then he remembered, well, I, I learned these relaxation skills back in the war, reading this book on hypnosis, so... Maybe I'll teach my kids to relax, and then I'll read their lessons to them or use these same relaxed states to rehearse uh, taking the exam. And the kids improved at such uh, to, to, to such an extraordinary degree that he began to develop skill sets and techniques that by, I think, 19... Well, 66, he started giving... Uh, uh, private classes, and I think he incorporated and began to teach the public in the early 70s. But for all that I learned from Jose Silva and this wonderful program, um, you know, I think the <laughs> the one technique that I use more than any other is simply when somebody asks me how I am, I say, better and better. You know, this is a little uh, kind of a dance that people do when they run into each other on the street or at work or on the telephone, we say, how you doing? But nobody really expects you to tell them how you're doing. And uh, if you're doing poorly and told them, they really wouldn't want to know. So it's just sort of this uh, little dance we do to give each other time to think of <laughs> what it is we want to say. How you doing? Fine. How are you? Fine. Even if we're not. And Jose said, why not say better and better? And he got it, actually, from a hypnotist from the 19th century, you know, an Emile Coué, who wrote a wonderful book called Suggestion and Auto-Suggestion. It's a little dry. It was really written for professionals in the field. And uh, translated from the French, it's every day and every way I'm doing better and better. 
And he would prescribe this as a remedy to people, whatever their problem, if they had a physical illness or they were emotionally traumatized. He suggested that they take a string, this is Emil Kuwe, long before Jose Silva, and tie 20 knots in the string and finger the string every morning and every night. And for each knot in the string, repeat to yourself aloud, Every day, in every way, I'm doing better and better. And then you go to the next knot, just to sort of, so you don't have to count, right? A counting device. 20 times in the morning, 20 times at night. Uh, panacea, universal, generic, good for what ails you. <laughs> kind of a deal. Every day, in every way, I'm getting better and better. Well, I started using that on the radio during my talk shows because no matter what the screener might tell the caller to say when they get on the air, like, thank you for taking my call to avoid that. They never do. They always forget. As soon as they're on the air, they say, how are you? Right? So talk to your host, say, fine. How are you? Fine. It gets boring as hell. I used to say Somebody better used to than say, uh, Better than some and not as good as others or something like that. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 there's a guy that says that. But uh, uh, I give attribution to Jose and Emil Kuwe for that. And uh, if people ever asked, I would tell that same story better and better. People love to hear that. It, it became sort of a signature, that in my closing, uh, better and better. Uh, if I'm sick, uh, how you doing? Better and better. If I'm well, how you doing? I'm better and better. Sometimes they say, oh, were you sick? No. I've, I, <laughs> but I'm Every day in every way, just feeling better and better. Why not? And and then look around you. What, organically speaking, what in nature that is alive and growing is not getting better and better? What is evolution but the unfolding? I like the word unfoldment. It suggests divine potential is in all things, and it's getting better and better and better. You know, we have plants evolve on this planet Earth for several million years before they learned how to make flowers. Flowers are fairly recent, only a few hundred million years ago. The plants got better. What's happening now? The flowers are getting more beautiful. You know, we're not going to see it in a single lifetime. Evolution is a very slow process. The fact that your body heals, think of that. Uh, a broken bone, a scratch, a cut, an abrasion that automatically, automatically, your body wants to heal. It wants to, even if you stop growing tall, you're getting better and better. So why push the river? It's uh, all unfolding as it should. And if we acknowledge that, then we can roll with that flow. Yeah, we owe a great deal to Jose Silva. You know, the, the better and better was a big thing, but you know what I got the most out of uh, his work was the cancel, cancel. The idea of if I have a negative thought that pops in my mind unabided, I didn't ask for it, it just popped in my mind, I have the ability, because I believe my thoughts are powerful and they affect me, I have the ability to cancel that thought by saying, his technique was cancel, cancel, that's what I used to do. I, I do it a little different now. I just sort of go, ah, I'm released. But, but the idea that, I can monitor all my thoughts. I can come from this place of being above my thoughts and watching the the, the thought train go down the tracks, or watch the uh, the uh, you know stream of consciousness go down the creek, or whatever. I can watch, and, and when I have a negative one, I can go, oh oh, cancel, cancel. Ah, glad I got that out of my system. And and to me, the ability to do that makes me no longer afraid of my negative thoughts. If I have a bad one, I know I can do something good with it, and, and it makes me sort of excited about all my thoughts, because whatever I think, I know I can do something positive with it. That's the real key. The key to positive thinking isn't just have a lot of good thoughts. It's it's do something positive with all of your thoughts. And Jose gave me this way of, of de dealing with my negative thoughts in a, in a wonderful way, just by saying cancel, cancel, and taking all their power away. It's it's such a wonderful technique. And, and again, if you believe it works, it works, you know, because the subconscious mind believes everything. It just whatever it doesn't know real from imagine. I mean you you're watching a movie and it really believes that, that that person just did that thing you saw in the movie. It really feels like it's real because or in a dream it feels like it's real. The subconscious isn't the one that judges and decides this is real or not real. That's the conscious. The subconscious mind just goes along with everything. So so if I have a negative thought in my mind, not only is my subconscious going along with it, 
it's agreeing with it, it's empowering, and it's hurting me. The, the, not only is there danger in, in agreeing with your negative thoughts because they hurt you, but the added danger is that you're wasting the opportunity for that voice inside to say something positive to help you become better and better. Wow, that's really good. Well, I think we should install this and uh, do an audio journey, go to paradise. The vast majority of books about the law of attraction or suggestion, auto-suggestion, hetero-suggestion, whatever, they talk about repetition, and repetition is important, but very few of the books, until recently, it's, it's, it's happening more and more, that people are understanding the value of first calming the mind, going into that wonderful state that brain researchers call the alpha brainwave level. It's a it's a real place. It's uh, marked at about 10 cycles per second. That's the frequency of brain waves. And you all know it. It's, uh, it's focused concentration. Uh, you add some enthusiasm. Obviously, we call it focused passion. But it's a place between awake, wide awake, and asleep. We sometimes call it narrow awake. It's where your attention is focused, and instead of 10 or 15 ideas in your mind competing for your attention, there's maybe only one or two. And when your mind is uncluttered, imagine water that's muddy and you let the mud settle out and then the water becomes clear. That's what relaxation and slow deep breathing and a little bit of guided imagery will do for you. And though, And then those Positive suggestions come through with much greater impact and require, frankly, less repetition. It's really pretty simple. It's letting the brain know I'm not in danger right now. There's no opportunity for me to need the part of me that's alert for danger right now. I'm safe, just like we do when we go to sleep at night. We say, I'm going to shut down systems. I'm safe. I don't have to watch out there. I don't have to listen out there. I don't have to be paying attention to all the stuff out there. Because now I've set up a circumstance where for the next X amount of time, I'm safe. So we close our eyes, we take a deep breath, we allow ourselves to know that we're absolutely safe, and all of a sudden all that energy that was gone out there can let go and turn around and start to come in here. So it starts with closing your eyes, taking a deep breath or two or three, and uh, feeling safe enough to... Imagine yourself in a place where you would be safe and where you would be surrounded by beauty, a place so nice, we call it paradise. Remember, the subconscious mind, which is 90 to 95% of your potential, doesn't argue with the conscious mind. So if you close your eyes and imagine yourself in paradise, in a beautiful place, wherever, a place you've actually been or a place entirely from your imagination. Subconscious mind believes it, says, okay, gosh, I guess we really are safe. And with a slow, deep breath or two and a little attention on letting go of muscular tension, you can actually feel the muscles unwinding, uh, feel the relaxation now in your body. Lift your attention gently to the space around your ears. And as you relax your scalp, simply form the intention to relax your scalp. And you'll actually feel the space around your ears sag or droop a little bit. In fact, most people report that it's more significant than they ever would have imagined. That If you're carrying tension in your scalp, Imagine the tension that you can release in the rest of your body, in your shoulders, and in your arms, all the way down to the tips of your fingers, in your torso, especially your upper back and shoulders. Just feel the softening, feel the letting go, and down through your pelvis and into your legs, feel relaxation like warm water in the shower running all the way down to your feet out the toes and feeling more and more relaxed feeling safe feeling relaxed 
And imagine yourself in this garden or this beautiful wilderness area, sitting upon the earth, supported by the earth, just as you're supported now by the chair or the cushion or the pillow upon which you sit. And you let go, knowing you're supported. The chair is not going to fall apart and drop you, nor will the pillow. You can really let go. And in this way, open yourself to a more positive attitude and positive beliefs and expectations. And in this place, you believe you're safe. And so you truly are. If in this place you believe you're smart, that will be who you are. You have the opportunity now to choose what you would like to believe. And those things that no longer serve you you can now relieve them of any duty they may have at any future time. You no longer need those old beliefs cluttering up your mind. So decide to let them go, those beliefs that serve you no longer. And put in their place some better beliefs, some beliefs that are that much stronger. Like, believe that you're smart, and believe that you're great, and believe that you have the power to create, and believe that you can do whatever it is you choose, that you have talents and gifts and abilities to use, and believe that you're loved and loving and lovable, and believe that love is your destiny. Believe that you can be what you really want to be. Believe it, and it becomes reality. Reality for you, it's perception, it's true, but that's what makes it all work. Relax and feel safe, and then recreate the attitudes. Choose one that work. And let's give it voice. Let's choose words that correspond with this new positive really beautiful, life-affirming attitude. For example, all things work together for good. Or things will work out. I feel supported by the universe, by providence, by the absolute, by God. Or Divine potential is always available to me. Or I am made of love and light. In fact, pause now and sitting receptive, open yourself to a message from the universe. A suggestion of a basic life premise from which all attitudes can proceed. Take just a few moments while Steve and I remain silent to listen for that encouragement now. Repeat it to yourself. Fine tune it. Make any adjustments that occur to you. And tell yourself this will be easy to remember.
and repeat it just a few more times. So believe you deserve to be loved. Believe that at your core. Believe you deserve to be loved. And what's more, once you know that this is true, that all love flows through your own love for you, then you'll know precisely what to do. Believe you deserve to be loved. Believe it at your core. Believe you deserve to be loved. And with that belief, what you'll have in store, with the knowledge that all love flows through, your own love for you, you'll have a precise plan of exactly what to do. Love yourself. And what you'll find is that love in your heart and that love in your mind goes everywhere and changes what you'll see. Your love creates your reality. So choose your beliefs, choose them with care, make sure everyone else is benefited there, have a positive attitude even when bad things occur. With a positive attitude, you'll be absolutely sure that you can make the best out of whatever happens, whatever comes your way. A positive attitude takes whatever happens and turns it in a positive way. Believe you deserve to be loved. And when you do, as all love flows through your own love for you, you'll know precisely what to do. Think about the room in which you sit and what you'll see in a moment when you open your eyes wide awake. And put a little smile on your face as you incorporate this new attitude and move from that place. This is the place where you stand, where you put your feet. This new positive premise, this attitude, this belief. And take a nice, slow, deep breath. And as you exhale, Open your eyes now, wide awake and alert, rested and refreshed, back in the room, feeling fine and better than before with a whole new lease on life, a new attitude and new beliefs. More than a lease, you bought the damn thing. You now own your life, you know. It's better even than a lease. It, it's, it's all about attitude. Everything is colored by your attitude, and it's something you get to choose. You may not get to choose much of what happens to you. Some, you know, we get to decide where we're going to be and when we're going to be there. We can put ourselves in the right place at the right time. But, gosh, stuff happens, and they make bumper stickers out of that. But you can choose your attitude. You can choose to have a good attitude when bad stuff happens and to have a good attitude when good stuff happens, and you can just choose to do that. And if you believe you have the power to make that choice and to make that choice happen, then that is what grants you the power. Your belief that your attitude is your choice makes that a true statement. You can also choose to spend a week with Steve and me here in Maui in February of 2011. The Maui retreat is ready to go. We're up and running. We've had, uh, we already have a couple of signups, uh, people who uh, send deposits and uh, have reserved their spots and Gosh, we're excited. The ball is rolling here. Uh, February 13th, and it'll start on a Sunday night and run through Friday afternoon. And you can come the weekend before that or stay a weekend after that. But um, this is going to be on 70 acres of privately owned land in paradise on Maui's northeast shore. If you want to look it up, it's just a little west of the world-famous Hana. Maui. Heavenly and, Hana. Yes, indeed. And it is heavenly. And we have a website up now that you can look at. Um, you can either go to bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash Maui hyphen retreat. Or probably easier if you just visit either one of our sister websites, go to focusedpassion.com or 
theagelesswisdom.com, and you'll see a link that will take you to that page. And if you have any questions, uh, shoot us an email. Write us at info at focusedpassion.com. Or just check it out to see the pictures, you know. Just just come and see the pictures. They're so cool. And I was just going to say, or you can also call, and, or let me say this, you can, and you can also call me. And uh, Steve probably won't be able to uh, return your call, but I, I'll bet you I can get back to you if you give me a couple of days. Uh, use my service in L.A. anytime, 24-7. It's uh, 818-973. 3154. Actually, that's the uh, contributor support line for the FocusPassion.com programs, premium audio programs. 818-973-3154. You can call anytime, 24-7. Leave your question with your full name, uh, telephone number with area code. Maybe a good time for us to get back to you if you have a question that... uh, we have it addressed on the website, but Steve's right. Um, our webmaster, Kurt Wyman, has done a wonderful job with photos, and uh, the uh, shopping cart is up there so you can make your reservation. We're limiting this to 25 people, so you're going to want to make a decision on this. And let me remind you, you're a listener in this program. You probably know this, but allow us to remind you, you don't need to know how you're going to do this if you're thinking, Gosh, I don't know if I can get the time off or uh, who's going to watch the dog while I'm gone. doesn't matter. Let that work out just by thinking about being here. What if every night you or you and your spouse went to sleep dreaming of the third week of February in Maui? A Walden-like retreat, an experience in mindfulness that is going to change your life, and I think we can guarantee that. You're going to be awakened. Thoreau had a great line about the dawn does not break upon those who are not awake. It's a pretty smart statement, and uh, we'll wake you up. We'll wake you up. We'll show you how to wake up and stay awake and be more awake every day in every way. Yeah, you know, just the sensory experience alone, the, the, your nose will have an ecstatic experience for a week. You know? And then what we're talking about really is bringing something so powerful into your five senses, what you see, what you hear, what you smell, all of that, so powerful for long enough. You know, you, you can have it for a day or two, it doesn't do it, but for a long enough, so it embeds inside of you, so you can anchor it, so you can, you know, Finally, be free of all the noise that the city has in your brain and all those commercials and all that stuff. Get that cleared. Get that all out. And then fill up with this brilliant, amazing paradise, this amazing, wonderful feeling so that you have access to it at home. This is the key. You'll be able to, when you go home and run into stressful situations that are inevitable, just with a deep breath, be able to bring back the feeling, the smell, the taste, the sound, the whole experience of paradise, and, and can you imagine how much better your responses are going to be coming from that attitude instead of coming from that stressed out attitude that you had before? It's, it's truly life changing. That's right. For the rest of your life, you'll be able to close your eyes and, with a single deep breath, convince the all powerful subconscious mind, the spiritual and psychological essence of who you truly are, that you're back in paradise. And from that level of peace and safety, The awareness that occurs to you includes not only a better understanding of who you are and what you're for and why you think, feel, and act the way you do, but it spills out into everything in your life and everyone you encounter, into your career and your avocations, and gives much more meaning to life. But it's not likely to happen to you if you're working 40 hours a week and commuting and and uh, keeping all those plates spinning. It's just too much clutter in the head. So join us. Check it out, focusedpassion.com. And there's also a podcast you can download that we did a couple of weeks ago that will answer a lot of your questions and I think inspire you to want to be part of the small group of a couple of dozen uh, people that, that spend the third week of February 2011 with us here in Maui. Um, so come spend uh, Valentine's week with us in Maui, and uh, 
bring your loved one. It's uh, lots of love here. Lots of love to take home with you from the beautiful, beautiful island of Maui. Thanks for being with us today. And as always, be gentle, love life, and take care of each other. For Steve Snyder, this is Michael Bunner. Aloha from Maui.